to all the, our uh, friends of Digital Futures. Uh, welcome back. Um, uh, it's a great honor for us uh, tonight to invite uh, Matter uh, Thompson, um, who is a very special researcher and uh, have a global influence. Actually, most of us know her name. It's a great honor for, uh, for the Digital Future platform, have a female uh, expertise coming here to make a special lecture. So this is a, a lecture series. The name is Performance-Based uh, Digital Design Methodology. And we invited um, seven uh, expertise, uh, including three female um, uh, uh, presenters coming to give us lectures. And um, uh, the, the platform is about a digital consortium doctor platform. Because of COVID-19, it's very difficult for traveling, especially uh, for global traveling. But uh, uh, this platform, a consulting platform, we invited and organized different lecture series to help uh, to reorganize the PhD program, especially for some frontier research from different schools, different styles of uh, the PhD uh, teaching and different kind of uh, program, different school setup. So it's a great opening, uh, uh, opening uh, 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 horizon to the, all the PhD students. I personally, have a lot of uh, takeaways from the past two weeks. And uh, I want to thank you all uh, who are here and who attend this special lecture series uh, for coming and making all the possible as a platform is really for you. Uh, to draw uh, closer to the Digital Consortium PhD platform lecture series, we have Nata Thompson, who is from Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts with us this evening. And, um, and who is an extraordinary researcher, scholar, an architect and artist for the final, uh, uh, final lecture of the, this lecture series. So Matter Thompson examining uh, the intersections between architecture and the new computational design processes. During the, the, the last 15 years, uh, her focus has been on the profound changes that digital technology instigated uh, in the way architecture is thought, designed, and built. In 2005, he found uh, the Center uh, for IT and Architecture Research Group at the Royal Academy School of the Architecture, Design, and the Conversation, where he has piloted a special research focus on the new digital material relations that digital technology brings forth. In investigating advanced computational uh, de uh, modeling, Digital Fabrication and Material Specification, CITA, CITA, has been the central in the forming of an, an international research field examining the changes to material practice in architecture. This has been led by a series of research investigation developing concepts and the technologies, as well as the strat strategy, strategy uh, projects, such as international uh, uh, Maria uh, Cruzi ITN network, Inno chain that um, fosters interdisciplinary sharing and the dissertation, dissert, uh, dissert, uh, dissemination of enterprise and supports new collaborations in the fields of architecture, engineering, and fabrication. And uh, he got, she also got a different advanced grant and complex modeling examining new modeling paradigms in computational design. She is currently general reporter and head of the, the science track for the UIA 2023 CPH World Congress, uh, Sustainable Futures, that's a special topic, leaves no one behind. Uh, uh, asking how, how architecture can contribute to the UN SDGs. So that's the um, um, introduction, but I cannot, um, totally uh, conclude what matter do uh, in, in the world. I think uh, she is really uh, play a very important leadership uh, in our research uh, field, especially the digital architecture. So looking forward, matter, give us a fantastic lecture, uh, please. Thank you so much, Philip, for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you also for the invite to take part in the Digital Futures platform. I think it's amazing that within one year on the back, then we all feel that, of course, the Digital Futures is a place where we all meet. I congratulate you on having been able to build this in such a 
dynamic and um, sort of uh, border finding uh, way. Um, I'm very pleased to be speaking today. Um, I was invited to give a four hour talk. <laughs> so I have pre prepared a very long talk and I wanted to uh, use the opportunity to um, introduce you to a personal journey into uh, my work on uh, sustainability and how uh, I feel that uh, new questions of sustainability are asking uh, new questions to the field of computational design. So um, I want to give you quite a uh, introduction to a theoretical platform that we are building uh, here in CETA and then uh, also try to very straightforwardly uh, discuss how that's informing our practice, what changes it's making to our practice and how it's leading our research uh, specifically into new uh, biodesign uh, uh, challenges um, that we are looking at uh, here in CETA. Um, so yeah, maybe without so much more ado, I will start. Um, I will start by introducing CETA to those of you who don't know CETA so much. CETA is a center for IT and architecture uh, based here at the Academy in Copenhagen. And we have existed for just a little bit more than 15 years now, uh, uh, which uh, uh, is, uh, is a long time. <laughs> I still feel that we are young, um, but it has also really changed uh, a lot over the years. So CETA has been many things um, across these years uh, and is still developing. We look at robotic fabrication, new material processes, uh, big data and machine learning, uh, extended reality, sense and sense making, looking at how uh, computation can be understood as a breadth of practices that are all interlink, giving us new design uh, parameters and new design practices uh, through by building emergent feedback loops. So what we have been looking at for the last uh, 15 years is really to understand to, how to curate and how to interface these feedback loops and what differences it makes to the way that we think and design and produce architecture. Um, I think uh, our remit is really to understand digital practice as a ground research question. I think we are very um, uh, curious to or looking at how the model changes um, uh, from a place of uh, uh, extension to a place where we are really sharing and mining and producing design information. We are often shown IT or computation as a tool of optimization, but I think what our field has a, in common is really base understanding that there is so much more at stake. And this is why it is a ground research question on par with what happened in the Renaissance, uh, you know, when we invented um, perspectives. Your leech is here. <laughs> he knows everything about this. So I think that in the same way, computation really rips the carpet out under our practice and redefines it in new uh, uh, and interesting ways. Um, we run a master's. I would like to just talk a little bit about what the relationship between research and education could be. I think it's very important for us as researchers to engage with uh, teaching and to understand how teaching um, challenges both our research culture, but also how it is fed by our research culture. Um, we, I think, I probably always, but certainly now, we need to ask what is the future that we're educating for and understand that the people that we are teaching now are going to live in very different worlds than the ones that we are occupying now. So that asks us, what are the skills that we need 
um, how do we engage our students in finding their own critical skill sets and um, practices to be able to uh, develop the future of architecture together with us. Uh, and what is the evolving role of the architect? What, what kind of roles do we need to teach for? Are we all um, generalists uh, teach, uh, learning one uh, shared practice? Or can we start thinking of our practice as being sort of sharp topology made out of many different competencies that come together in different ways? Um, and how do we um, enable our students to ask new questions of how environment, um, nature, and technology intersect, and how we want to occupy the world around us? Um, how do we, together with them, uh, help ourselves to be continuously asking ourselves what uh, material practice and architecture can be? Um, and uh, how do we uh, ch together uh, find ways of expanding representation to be able to um, both uh, design but also specify and steer the environments uh, of the future. Um, so I think more than anything we need to ask ourselves how do we design for an unpredictable future? And what are the tool sets that we need to bring forward into this um, uh, way of thinking? Um, so CETA has been many things over many years. I would like to show this little trajectory here to be able to start this personal journey of how we are moving forward. Um, maybe we started with an interest in interface ecologies looking at how um, AI and uh, augmented reality this is back in 2005 so maybe another generation of AI and uh, augmented reality really could uh, allow us to think very differently about the um, intersections between the virtual and the uh, physical which very uh, fast uh, became a stepping stone into uh, a work with ideas about um, robotics and an em embodiment of the same ideas through uh, robotic membranes, which led to interest in textiles um, uh, and distributed computing, uh, which then again fed to new ideas on digital crafting, digital fabrication, um, where we looked at uh, how new materials could be worked with in old ways and old materials could be worked with in new ways, which led to um, complex uh, modeling framework, which we've been working on um, approximately since 2012 to 2019, really trying to understand how the infrastructures of our uh, 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 digital models allow us to think very differently about what it means to design, optimize, uh, specify, and fabricate. And then the new uh, framework, which we have just received a framing bid for from the European Research Council, uh, looking at an eco-metabolistic architecture, which will take us from, from now to 2026. And so I would like to not go through the entire history of this, but if we started with some sort of points of departure uh, in the complex modeling network made out of several larger uh, framing projects, including uh, inner chain that um, uh, Philip talked about before, what we were looking at is here really is trying to understand how the logic of our models can be uh, expanded and to really question what does it mean to make information models so beyond BIM but still within the idea of the networked digital model that communicates across multiple digital practices. Interchain was definitely one of the key stepping stones in this project um, also because of the work obviously but also because of the network that it established so it connected us uh, in a collaborative way with Central European um, uh, institutions, including the Bartlett and ITKE and Angewandte and IAC, um, who are good colleagues, but it's 
one thing to be good colleagues and it's also another thing to work together and i think it was really wonderful to use the inner chain program as a way of sharing not only uh, research results but also the, the questions uh, the fundamental underpinning of research frameworks the theories of of this of uh, digital design and also its methodologies so how do we actually what are the differences in our different viewpoints uh, as we move into the uh, digital um, questions here we were looking at were very quite uh, differentiated but had in common this uh, curiosity towards uh, the digital chain and how by expanding the digital chain from an idea of design to fabrication into one that would include analysis, would include prediction, would include material design, how that could actually allow us to think very differently about the future uh, practices of architecture, engineering and fabrication. The, the, the complex modeling framework also led to a book that we designed um, or wrote, it's called, uh, which allowed us to tease out five core concepts for developing feedback and design um, and also enabled us to start thinking um, more theoretically or um, constructing the theoretical basis of, of this part of our practice um, in which I think the key question is really uh, about how to develop uh, digital design methods for implementing feedback between different scales of um, engagement and how that can lead to better, uh, more sustainable uh, uh, and more optimized uh, building practices. Um, and the theoretical sort of underpinning, which I believe is shared to, to the field, is really this idea that computation can allow us to formalize the properties of behaviors of materials. Um, and through that, to, that we can then represent them and thereby also uh, instrumentalize them and allow us to actually steer material behavior. So if this is a, this is a theory, you know, it's not a truth, it's a theoretical uh, proposition, which I think underpins uh, a lot of our field. And what the book tries to do is to sort of mm, tease out what are the core dimensions or core instrumentalization of this theory that allows us to think about this. So adaptive parametrization is the idea that the parametric model means obviously to uh, incorporate ways of being able to discover uh, uh, and re-parameterize uh, um, uh, across the design process. Integrated analysis is the idea of importance of simulation into design practice simulation as not one sort of pre-event or well-packaged event but as something that is reiterative and also distributed across the design chain uh, bringing us to the model multi-scalar modeling framework as being a way to understand and interface material understanding at multiple scales and to intersect into a multi-scalar design space how uh, different or uh, uh, meso scales that allow us to formalize and re-parameterize uh, models at high and low scale uh, bridging into information bridge design the idea of engaging with vast design spaces and finding out how to uh, employ prediction and uh, machine learning to be able to engage and also um, uh, uh, steer uh, design across uh, that kind of um, uh, uh, design thinking also understanding how sensing becomes uh, and sense data explodes the digital model into very different uh, uh, yeah, depths maybe, <laughs> but just that the information that is incorporated as we go from a geometric based uh, design model into other kinds of design models or design information, what does that also mean to how we handle information, how we share information and um, uh, how we uh, uh, reinterpret information. Uh, 
And finally, the idea of topological modeling, the uh, question of understanding the parametric model as a topology uh, and being able to find ways of negotiating these um, topologies. So I think um, the core thing uh, that is at the stake in many of these or across this project is this um, key framing of our practice as being a step into sustainability. And this is what I would like to discuss today to say, how is it that our field actually becomes, uh, or how is, it, how is it that sustainability challenges our field? I think that from about 2010 onwards, we have been writing all our bids as being a part of a sustainability uh, uh, endeavor. We think that um, computation will allow us to optimize material practice and thereby uh, bring us to a lighter building culture that uses materials smarter. Um, and thereby uh, we, we draw in uh, sustainability as a consequence of our, uh, of our practices. But I think one of the key questions we need to ask uh, is what is optimization and what how does optimization actually ask or can digital optimization is that the right way to engage with sustainability um yeah so i would like to i'm going to make a little break now so in the so i would like to start presenting some of our work with the ideas of sustainability um and and enter this in a sort of slightly broad way um not to sort of regurgitate many of the statistics that we're all aware of, but maybe to set a stage and to, to declare a point of view um, from which we can then enter a discussion. So, of course, we, we see ourselves uh, entering a situation of crisis. Uh, we understand that we are stand before climate breakdown or uh, climate change, as it's benignly uh, called. Um, with huge consequences such as biodiversity loss. Uh, and also, uh, as we enter uh, this era, we are sitting on an exponential curve. We know we need to build for or create environments for 2 billion people more in the next 30 years. We can also see that these people do not live in contexts like mine. This is uh, our lab, CETA in Copenhagen but rather that they live in other continents and also that they live in cities. So we understand that a world population is really, uh, uh, and, and city building is really uh, the 21st century most transformative trend. So it creates a sort of new need for architecture. And I, we also hear this a lot in our own field, but also across the um, a board that there's a sense that well, uh, it means that we need to scale up, we need to build more. Um, but maybe we should also ask, what should we build? Um, so we see architecture, I think, as a, as, a, as a practice. We see architecture as a particular a practice that has the uh, power to enable uh, change in multiple ways through the social, uh, through uh, um, the material uh, and through the technological, um, but also as a critical tool with by which to engage. We see that architecture can create spaces of inclusivity um, and can discuss uh, uh, the ways that our, we are shaping our societies. Um, I think a, a clear way of understanding or um, I don't know, a, a way of, uh, of entering this is to think about the uh, problem of resource scarcity. So we know that architecture and the built environment uh, uses about 40% of all extracted resources with 30 or 40% of them being energy. And so of course our field has enormous impact. If we can optimize our resources, the way we use resources in architecture, we can impact globally uh, in very important ways. Um, the back uh, uh, story of this uh, uh, is uh, industrialized construction. So uh, in a sort of Western uh, historical backdrop, uh, then industrialization is a way of lifting ourselves out of the slums, providing mass housing through cheap 
mass products produce stock, uh, which allowed a post-war society to be reconstructed. And I understand that in different contexts in the world, these stories are still being played out in very important ways. Um, but it still means, whether it's historical or contemporary, it still necessitates a, a critique. Um, industrialization has also created a dependency on a, very, uh, on a very certain group of materials. We often say that architecture is addicted to concrete and steel. I kind of like the idea of an addicted practice. Um, but uh, and that both materials are very detrimental to the environment. We uh, know stories like this, that the concrete is tipping us into a climate catastrophe, um, uh, or that we are uh, using up the sand commons uh, in, a, in a very, very rapid way. So it is clear to us that we need to, to readdress our um, uh, dependence on the geosphere and uh, non-renewables. Um, industrialization has also come with a disregard to waste. It's built on the idea that waste is a necessary byproduct of efficiency and optimization. And waste appears in many different forms. It appears in overproduction, in wasteful manufacture, in fundamentally subtractive fabrication technologies and in over-engineering in dormant materials that lie and wait for the catastrophic storm, 100-year storm. Uh, and finally, also our inability to re-extract materials uh, on disassembly. It has brought us to an idea of material depletion, the idea that we are running out of materials, um, which is, of course, a little bit um, uh, um, uh, it's a very particular perspective because our global system is, is a finite state. Materials are still here, um, but they are not uh, available to us in the same ways. So we can see graphs like this, born in 2010, how much is left for us, uh, for me. Uh, we can see uh, that this uh, idea of that the materials are, are um, uh, depleting under our ground. With, and this is not just a resource problem. I think often when we look at this and think, oh, we're running out of sand, there's no more sand. Um, but in reality, it is also about the direct ecological, social and cultural um, effects that these uh, uh, methods of extraction have on our societies. Um, and obviously also to biodiversity. So um, a, a reason why we have been, or a, a way in for us to engage with these questions is our work in the, uh, in the uh, UIA uh, World Congress that Philip mentioned in his introduction, um, where we have been asked by the Danish um, Architectural Association, who is leading the Congress in 2023. Uh, uh, they have invited Martin and I, Martin Tamgenle, colleague here at CETA, um, to be general reporters. And that means that we are heads of the science track. Um, Congress is about sustainable futures. It's called Sustainable Futures, uh, Leave No One Behind, and about how the uh, architecture can be used as a tool to achieve the, uh, the SDG, so the Sustainable Development Goals set out by the uh, UN. Um, it's an interesting organization that's existed since the war, uh, and it has also um, uh, had this World Congress uh, every three years, uh, nearly ever since, and it attracts up to 10 to 15,000 participants from the entire world. When it was in Seoul in 2017, I believe there were 12,000 people. This is not quite our ambition in the post-COVID time. This will be quite different. But I think it's very interesting because it has this very, very broad um, uh, address to the entirety of architecture. Um, and it is global. So it is to all architects in all the world of all practices. And that's a different um, uh, stone to step on. Um, Martin and I have been appointed uh, uh, heads of the scientific track, and we are uh, sitting on the midpoint. 
So the SDGs were launched in 2016 and are to be completed in 2030. And 2023 lies as an interesting midpoint between the two, allowing us to think about it as a sort of litmus test. Maybe we are building the practices that then need to be carried out um, for us to actually achieve the goals by 2030. Um, this gives us another kind of urgency, another kind of speed, which was also uh, named in other ways, uh, the idea of a decade of action, 2020 to 2030, as the moment in which we need to fundamentally change, not just think about how to change, but also fundamentally change our practices. So a key, key question for us is to ask how do we identify the agency, the drivers and barriers of architecture as a means of achieving the SDGs. At present, none of the SDGs, a little bit the one that's called the um, uh, uh, resilient communities, um, uh, mention the built environment. The architecture is simply a blind spot. And of course, if we ask architects how we affect the way we use resources and the way we understand uh, uh, human needs, then we are absolutely central, uh, uh, a central instrumentalization about how society actually um, furnishes or uh, builds our communities. Um, so architects do know that they are part of the question, but UN does not necessarily. I think there are other ways that we can see the same movement if we look at um, sort of stories. I think uh, Schumacher said that the Pritzker Prize had become an instrument for do-gooders. I, I, I uh, paraphrase, but I think uh, it's interesting because it is also the same move for understanding the context uh, of, of uh, construction in very different ways. Uh, we can see here uh, Michael uh, Ritchie's uh, winning the Sterling uh, Prize or uh, uh, the emergence of publications that really understand how or try to frame how uh, architecture uh, is, um, yeah, has agency in shaping social and environmental boundaries. We were very inspired by a particular paper uh, written by uh, Boxtrom and all in 2019 which is, declares the topic of the uh, um, planetary boundaries, um, of which a colleague of ours here local to Copenhagen, Catherine Richardson, is co-author. And in conversation with her, we were interested in understanding how to think about the SDGs, um, not just as a series of 17 separate goals that can seem a bit kaleidoscopic, but rather as a continuity stretching from the needs of the environment to the needs of the humans and understanding how key topics, technology, the social, ecology, and the governmental uh, also is brought into the fore of this. This has led us to, to produce uh, six panels, research panels, by which we will structure um, the event in 2023, there's still a while to go, um, where we are trying to sort of to, to create new boundaries for how we think uh, uh, architecture can be framed. Some of them are pretty straightforward. We can rec recognize them very easily, resilient communities, maps very easily onto urbanism uh, or climate adaptation. We can also see quite clearly but there are also new ones. We thought Design for Health was very innovative when we did this two years ago, but with COVID, obviously, we were shown to be right. We have appointed a scientific uh, panel, a committee, scientific committee uh, of people who are helping us to start now to flesh out these uh, questions and to start understanding how we can really reconsider um, the actions that are already taking place and the actions that need to take place for architecture to truly produce a sustainable architecture from the environmental across the technological and to the social. Uh, we made this international mapping that we think is a very helpful tool to understand the breadth of people working within the field. It's downloadable, this wonderful link here. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, if anyone feels that they are, they should be part of this mapping, we would be very, very pleased to hear from them. Um, 
So we are trying to use the event as a way of challenging the status quo. And I think a way to start scratching at that surface is really to ask about three insinuated, three emergent problem areas or solution spaces that somehow uh, architecture as it is right now is not understood. Uh, um, you know, our current pro pro practices of industrial design and production is not understood broad enough, does ad not adequately follow, allow um, local uh, grassroots based solutions or low tech thinking. At the same time, it's not radical enough. Um, it understands the technologies of design and fabrication as following a positivist agenda conceptualized through pragmatic means and guided by quantitative standards. And finally, it is not interdisciplinary enough. Ecological thinking challenges the boundaries of architectural conception, um, connecting traditional spatial and programmatic uh, thoughts to wider, a, a wide array of new disciplines. And in that way, it asks us to reconsider the boundaries of our field. Um, so the call will come out in 2022. Uh, this event will happen in 2023. We have Springer involved as our uh, publisher and we would love that everyone will participate. So I thought I would have a break here, but that's because I thought that you were PhD students sitting around a table and I realized that um, that's not the way that this is organized. Um, and so I think we'll just move on, no, Philip? Yeah, please move on. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So going from the general and the sort of framework building, I would like to start to talk about, well, how does our, this CETA then work with this? Um, and I would like to bring us back to this question about what is optimization um, uh, and a theoretical framework that I was uh, 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 pointing at as a result of our um, writing of this complex modeling book. And here, um, if you bear with me just a little bit more, um, I'd like to just situate a series of ideas on the horizon a little bit fast and then move to actually show some uh, projects that are, are starting to deal with these questions. Um, most fundamentally, I think sustainability relies on a new concept of nature. It's a new way of understanding nature. If Darwin introduced us to a mutable and disharmonious understanding of environment in which struggle, change or mutation are key concepts, then sustainability also calls us to rethink what nature is and how we relate to it. Um, as we understand as we move through this, we understand that we are living in, this, in, a, in the Anthropocene, an era formed by human action. Um, we, when we look at the Anthropocene or try to look at definitions of the Anthropocene, we can see that there are very different definitions emerging, uh, ranging from the emergence of agriculture 10,000 before Christ or to the 1950s and the detonation of the atom bomb. So we have very, very different uh, uh, concepts of what the Anthropocene means. Um, but uh, fundamentally, it is the way that we as humans are changing the ecosystems and the geologies of our plan planet in very visible uh, ways. A starting point to this era I would uh, uh, adhere to it lies with the uh, Industrial Revolution and the fundamental changes that um, the way that society is organized and resources used. Um, and I would add to that it disassociates or dislocates resource with consumption, bringing us into a globalized economy and making it difficult to relate to the direct effects and in the same vein, centralizing production as direct effects of using materials and they're in the same vein, centralizing production um, uh, dislocating consumption and production. So you have something where, where is the resource, where is the production, and where is the consumption. And as this line just gets wider and wider, it's very hard for us to actually engage with uh, uh, the consequences, social, uh, environmental, uh, biodiversity uh, uh, related consequences of our consumption. Um, 
uh, an important part of sustainability is economy. And I am not an economist, and this is far from my uh, comfort zone. Um, but I think that this idea of growth is so fundamental to how our society operates, and therefore very different. It's very fundamental to the way that we can understand or think about change. So it's important for us to engage with economics of sustainability, economic uh, foundations of sustainability uh, to be able to actually operate within this field. Um, in the Club of Rome in the 1970s, uh, there is the first sort of criticality to the idea of a sort of uh, neo-classicist understanding of um, uh, uh, endless growth, uh, bringing us into an idea of a um, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, an oxymoron of sustainable growth. The idea of sustainable growth being an oxymoron. What does that mean to the way that we understand industrialization and the way that we understand optimization? Um, returning to the idea of ecological impacts, I think it's also important to understand the relationship between ideas of economy and ideas of uh, resource procurement. Here uh, we could I think a, a very inspiring point of reference for me is Jevons' paradox. He was a, a theorist in the 19, in 1860s who wrote a book uh, on coal uh, on, the, on coal consumption, and his uh, thesis was that coal consumption doesn't decrease as they became better and better at using coal. Instead, it increased. So optimization does not lead to the decrease of the use of a material, but rather to the increase of the use of the material, enabling us to use the material smarter. And this is important for our way of considering uh, uh, efficiency, um, being uh, fundamentally, or perhaps, a false premise for our field. Um, and this goes so much against our my own thinking of our field, and the, I think the fundamental uh, uh, infrastructures of, of understanding what a, a digital instrumentation is actually doing for material practice. Um, the great insight of uh, sustainability is its interconnectedness. So this idea that we are part of the world that affects us. If modernity was defined as a window against nature from which man could interact in a separated way to nature, then sustainability uh, fundamentally brings us into uh, nature and makes us part of nature. Um, Odom, uh, the uh, first ecologist uh, in the 1950s, um, is the father of ecosystem uh, thinking. Um, and he understood, uh, he, he made this very interesting study um, of the Silver Springs in, in uh, Florida, in which he's, he really draws out, he draws the first uh, full or complete analysis of a natural ecosystem. Um, it's interesting to think about that the way that he does this is uh, fundamentally mechanistic. He's very interested in the energy input into the, into the uh, ecosystem thinking. And this is interesting because he's contemporary with other modes of emergent system thinking um, in cybernetics, uh, where we start understanding this uh, sort of idea of feedback and um, system design as a way of understanding uh, the world around us. Um, yeah, I'll just skip a bit. Uh, so the point is really that there is no nature. We are nature and nature and us are one. And this breaks down, helps us with sustainability and the idea of systems thinking <clears throat> helps us break down the barrier between self and environment or, uh, or nature, if, if you want. I'll just jump a little bit to get to a little bit more uh, central ideas here. Um, yeah. So what is this bent in CETA? Um, in our work, uh, the concept of the Anthropocene and the planetary boundaries challenge us to reconsider the material basis of our uh, practice and to ask ourselves how to move from a dependence from the geosphere of non-renewable materials into the uh, uh, um, abundancy 
of the of renewables of the biosphere so rather than thinking of practices of extraction we need to think of our material world as one we are co-producing through practices of growing and harvesting challenging the perception challenging the perception of our environment as something inert to something essentially living this allows us to move from the purely biomimetic in which nature acts only as an image by which to work into a truly living environment in which we are part of build, uh, uh, in which nature itself becomes part of the built environment and thereby to ask what does it mean to co-inhabit uh, with other organisms um, and what uh, uh, and how how can we steer and functionalize uh, living uh, technologies or living materials so it moves us from an idea of circular economy to an idea of regenerative design. So if circular design, circular economies is now defining, redefining itself as a radically repairing, interconnected and regenerative practice, then uh, it, what we are trying to see here is how can we in, in, uh, use computation and computational method methodologies to enact this circularity and this feedback across different material systems. So there are, of course, uh, bioeconomy, biodesign, uh, uh, or bio-based circular uh, economy are very well fleshed out uh, uh, frameworks. And we could say that there are competing narratives of uh, biodesign within the field of architecture and design. Um, so you could say, well, there are frameworks where we understand biodesign as uh, new business opportunities, opening up new markets for growth. Or you could also say, well, there are systems for replacing existing material systems with new renewable or non-pollutant uh, materials. Or perhaps there are, in fact, a fundamental design challenge that allows us to really reconsider uh, methods of production um, and methods of uh, design um, uh, specification. It's important to remember that biodesign is not a sort of um, carte blanche where we can just sort of enter and then there's just enormous amounts of material. Biodis biomass is a limited resource and um, it's based on the idea of photosynthesis. And when we were talking to Catherine Richardson, our uh, friend from before, uh, she told us, well, we know that uh, uh, the, the, the amount of photosynthesis that happens in the globe is stable. So of course we can change where we're using photosynthesis, but it is not a sort of endless resource. We cannot just grow more. And I think another dimension in that is the, uh, the immediate threat of, of, uh, of um, impoverishing our topsoils, which is a very real um, uh, practice that's happening right now around us. Of course, we can, we can think about new practices of upcycling agricultural waste. I think this is a sort of low hanging fruit in the field, super interesting. There's a lot of innovation to do in that field. Um, in CETA, this has led to questions of what is biomass? So I think um, Needham's book from 1963 called The Uniqueness of Biological Materials has been really inspiring um, uh, to me in the sense that um, it really starts temporalizing biomass. So what he says that is biomass is a material system that, that is a, a, a steady state system um, and that it takes not more than a couple of a few thousand years at most, he says, for it to be fully uh, recycled um, or to have fully uh, gone through its cycle. And I think as an architect, I'm not so scared of a few thousand years. No? We know that architecture, maybe not the architecture we produce today, but architecture can easily uh, uh, operate in the, in the schema of, of millennia. So it means that the time frame of architecture and the time frame of biomass starts um, intersecting. Um, this is uh, this fundamental circularity of biomass is really what is the most important part of, of uh, entering uh, a bio design remit uh, for us. And it results in a fundamental temporality 
to uh, bio-based materials um, that we need to engage with. And I think the most important part of this is really that it challenges the idea of firmitas. If we follow Vitruvius, then we could say, well, um, instead of architecture being static and being as designed, we need to think about architecture through the uh, temporal and as dynamic and changing, um, uh, which means that the fundamental axiom of firmitas is challenge, but also the fundamental value proposition. What is it? Why when you buy a piece of architecture, how that that is actually fundamentally rethought. Um, yeah, so it leads us from a Vitruvian ideal of uh, the eternal or the permanent uh, to a very different architectural ideal um, uh, of that which is uh, continuously morphing, growing, uh, decaying, becoming, uh, which uh, 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 challenges not only what we think our materials are, but also our representational underlying representational system. So as materials change, so must our representations. Uh, and, and how do we reconsider and instrumentalize our uh, models to be able to work with a material that is continuously in flux. Yeah. So um, in our work, we have been interested in framing this uh, in a three-part perspective through ideas of the harvested, the grown, and the living. And I'm going to talk about this in very absolute terms, as if we will never look at a piece of steel or a piece of concrete again. But I would also like to point at a portfolio of work, which is looking at interesting uh, intersections between the digital and the or the the uh, uh, geospheric uh, extracted resource and the grown resource uh, as being very interesting points. Here, uh, this is Adrian uh, Bruns' project um, uh, as led by, he's a student of ours in our master's program, who won a, a concrete printing uh, competition, was able to build this wonderful full-scale demonstrator in which um, mycelium is used as an interior uh, uh, substrate as insulation, um, it's then perforated with these really interesting ventilation holes, allowing him to think of the uh, sort of living uh, uh, wall in which the living material is functionalized as a uh, insulation uh, uh, system. So what I I don't think we should be religious is what I'm trying to say. I think that that there are many interesting hybrids along the way. But I want to try to def uh, develop this, this framework and start pointing at some starting projects that we have been doing in this. If we start with the harvested, then obviously we see harvested materials all around us, uh, timber being primary perhaps, but bamboo or reed or straw also being cemented part of building history. But there's also a whole range of other materials that we harvest from the environment. Rubber is still harvested for tires, um, uh, for, for trucks. You can still not make synthetic rubber uh, uh, at that uh, um, endurance scale. Um, and harvested materials have also been uh, theorized across many different eras and practiced as high-tech or artisanal craft. So, in this world, we have been interested particularly in, in timber. Um, timber dates back millennia. There are examples of timber constructions that are 10,000 years old, um, and they can last for over a thousand years. There are examples of timber structures that, that, uh, that are themselves where the material itself is a thousand years old. And clearly we sit in a renewed interest, in an era of renewed interest, in which timber is identified as one as the few ecologically sound building material being renewable, recyclable, energy inefficient, and acting like a carbon sink. So um, in this, we see engineered timber as a particular uh, aspect. And we have been working on Rolam. Philip, I think I showed you the very first parts of Rolam. Um, 
some years ago. Um, and now we are moving forward with it, in which we are trying to optimize the material resource. So raw lamb, in difference to other kinds of um, blue lamb materials uh, or, or CLTs, um, tries to use the, a breadth of material range where we strategically place different um, uh, qualities of materials uh, 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 in a very sort of information specific or information rich uh, design practice in which we understand the timber as a whole resource and then are able to strategically place the material uh, qualities in respect to the performance that is needed. So you can see this is, uh, this is actually the exhibition opened I think yesterday or something. No, we don't have pictures of it where it's uh, fully, uh, you can see the thing uh, finished. Um, you can see here some of the uh, uh, raw uh, pieces of uh, uh, glue lamp uh, elements that are then composed to create uh, these uh, very rough um, uh, 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 uses of material in which we uh, are able to use a broader range of the resource. The project came out of the inner chain project uh, in which um, Tom Scrims, uh, sorry, I'll just follow the narrative properly here. Um, so uh, we are working with Microtech, which is an uh, Italian company who has created these CT scanners that are now, uh, I mean, industry, top standard, uh, but still are, are existing in industry, in which materials are then CT scanned or trees are, are CT scanned, um, given digital fingerprints so that they can identify uh, the different qualities. So these look like images, but they are scans and the grayscale is actually describing material density and therefore material performance. Um, this taps very st straightforwardly into our local context um, in which uh, uh, the, the aim to uh, create a carbon neutral um, building practice uh, by 2030 has led our neighboring city Malmö uh, to understand that timber, they need to transition to timber con uh, construction. Uh, if we look across other borders, we can see that the timber is becoming uh, incredibly, uh, the price of timber has gone crazily up. The, uh, the, the uh, demand on timber is, is, uh, is rising uh, violently. But it's important to understand timber in context. Timber uh, is uh, maybe it's smart to use timber in the built environment, but where I think it's up to, I can't remember the percentage, a very high percentage of timber is used in pulp pulp is paper and toilet paper, they have very, very short lifespans and therefore are very bad carbon storage. So it makes my very good sense to use timber in construction because it is there longer and therefore it is a better carbon sink. However, uh, uh, when we grow timber uh, and harvest it or, or um, uh, cut it down, then uh, we um, uh, the, it, it really is very detriment to the uh, way that timber can store uh, carbon. So it means that um, uh, we need to think very, uh, uh, we need to rethink our practices of uh, felling uh, timber uh, to be able to understand how we can use the resource more intensively. At the same time, we know that the timber industry as it is, is extremely wasteful. Materials are, um, uh, 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 cut down uh, within the process and that up to 80% of material can be lost in some of timber uh, construction processes. Um, the project came out of, the, of Interchain with Tom Svillens, who is now doing a postdoc here, did a PhD during the uh, uh, Interchain project in which he was working with um, internationally leading uh, uh, timber element producer uh, Pluma Lehmann in Switzerland, looking at a very advanced uh, robotic uh, uh, fabrication uh, methods for building complex freeform uh, 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 timber elements for 
projects such as Shapiro Bam's uh, 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 buildings. Um, here, the interest was really to strategize material resource, understand how the fiber angle could be better strategized within the glue lamp beams to therefore be able to optimize uh, uh, the glue lamp beams performance. Um, timber is uh, so in in Rolam one in which in the early probe that we built, we started thinking about how to place the actual uh, high quality timber there where it's needed at the edges of the material around the joint of the material or around the footing of the material. Um, and place lower qualities uh, um, uh, in the middle. So the point was to then uh, find ways of modeling uh, the material resource. Uh, we, together with Microtech, uh, got a physical data set, just three trees and the, uh, and the linked uh, uh, computation or CT scans. Um, and then, uh, 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 started to produce uh, our own uh, ways of um, um, glass of water, break, I think. Um, uh, our own ways of modeling, uh, uh, of finding ways of, of designing the, um, uh, modeling the information that could allow us to optimize the material resource. Um, skip this, but obviously timber is part of a larger digital chain going from the forest in which we have machinery that's highly uh, intelligent um, and uh, uh, digitally controlled uh, to uh, timber milling uh, and to resource uh, uh, procuration uh, and then to the product. Uh, what we're looking at in uh, Rolam is to understand the extended digital chain within uh, 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 Timber to be able to understand how design integration of performance criteria to resource can allow us to optimize uh, material resource. So we can create these images that allow us to understand the CT scan uh, by uh, 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 tracking the imagery of the CT scans. We can understand the knots and the pits, the uh, inner tree from the outer tree. And we can create these images that really under tell us where high quality and low quality uh, timber is. Um, and then we can interface this with an actual sourcing of the material where we understand the performance of the element, uh, where we actually need the material resource and then map that onto the tree uh, resource, uh, leading to then uh, uh, projected uh, um, cutting patterns that is then uh, uh, directly implemented in the glue lamp. So it means that when we're working with these designs, then we have used um, machine learning and k-means clustering to actually understand where the resources to best optimize the cutting patterns of, the, uh, of each plank and to then recompose them into the components. So really looking at glue lamp as a very highly specified or hyper-optimized uh, material uh, process. And here you can see some of the images of it and the elements as they're coming together. The uh, exhibition is made in multiple phases. Uh, this is phase one, what we just saw here. You can see it's one tripod here. Um, in the November, we are building a second tripod uh, for an exhibition in Aarhus. And then in February, we build, or April, we build a third element that is then brought together in Umeå, uh, which is in northern Sweden, um, using a local resource. So going from using Italian tree to a local Swedish tree. Uh, yeah. And here we can see the actual mapping of the material from plank to plank uh, into the, the uh, unique uh, beam. And also the variation of the different lamella, lamella being the actual tree strips that are being glued together in the glue lamp, uh, glue lamp uh, uh, for straight and curvy pieces. Obviously, uh, when we make a straight piece, we can have more chunky bits than when you need a, a single curvature. Uh, um, uh, bent pieces, they have much thinner lamella. 
uh, which is also allowing us to optimize the material resource. Yeah. So the question for our uh, remit within the harvested is really to harvest the inherent material properties of timber. We need to develop the ability to capture the heterogeneity of the single timber section, represent its complexity, predict its structural performance and its associated behaviors and interface these with novel maids, modes of uh, design and fabrication um, for the optimization of material deployment in the bespoke timber element. It would then take me to the second part of this tri triptych, uh, which is the design. Um, uh, sorry, here. Um, the design, it, if we looked at the technolo technological platform going from 10,000 years old, working with timber um, and having uh, uh, material resources that can also last. Uh, for a very long time, then the design belongs more to a technological platform of the 20th century, belonging to uh, the idea of composing materials, designing materials um, in a polymer uh, form, uh, like we see uh, with fossil fuels. Um, bioplastics for construction is, is not new, it preceded uh, fossil fuels. Uh, here is an example of a soybean car from 1941. Um, Henry Ford standing proudly next to it. Um, what we, but what they were outcompeted by fossil fuels simply because of their unpredictability and their uh, lesser durability. Our question is how can advanced computation and our ability to predict material behavior allow us to work more strategically with these um, temporally plastic behaviors uh, and understand them as part of a of a, a building material that maybe has an, another way of being uh, engaged with maybe being replaced or being maintained in in the quicker cycles than we normally think in the build environment it's uh, also very uh, uh, connected to the maker movement of recipe sharing um, or uh, I think it's Greg Lynn's uh, idea of uh, from tectonics to cooking in a bag, but here maybe version two, as we move uh, from uh, uh, the fossil fuel based um, uh, polymers to biopolymers. In our project, we're interested in this very um, a hard uh, extruded uh, materials. Uh, this is a biopolymer that is um, reinforced with cellulose, which is allowing us um, to build these components. The project is actually not about, it's called predicting response, it's actually not about, um, sorry for the quality here, uh, uh, about the materials, but it's funded through um, a, a framework for funding uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So the project is really about understanding um, material behavior and using um, AI to be able to predict material behavior, to, pre uh, to be able to uh, expand upon and navigate uh, a recipe space uh, through design of experiments, um, and then uh, to also use AI to intelligently uh, control robotic fabrication. So we have AI sort of stacking through three different, pro three different parts of the project, uh, trying to allow us new practices to work with, or to develop new practices to work with uh, dynamic uh, uh, behaviors of uh, bio-based materials. Um, this should be a video, yeah. Uh, so here we are with the material. You can see they're very hard. They're also pretty springy. They're a little bit like a cardboard or uh, they're very light. They are based, I think it's on 80% uh, 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 water, uh, which allows our rheology to be controllable, but also uh, needs to evaporate out of the material, which creates um, uh, big uh, geometric uh, uh, differentiations between wet state and dry state. Uh, so uh, our project looks at how we can uh, build up the sensor frameworks and uh, both digital and, and physical uh, uh, censoring uh, of the material and then uh, be able to uh, uh, build predictive models by which we can understand what we need to print to be able to 
uh, get what we are looking for. Um, the components are uh, get this particular geometry in the way that we are stabilizing the prints to be able to uh, uh, make these interior walls um, and follow sort of a, a 3D puzzle kind of uh, logic in the way that they are interlinking both in in uh, sort of stacking uh, both uh, vertically and uh, horizontally. Um, uh, you're of course uh, very aware of um, SUTD's uh, research within the same field. Um, we are, uh, uh, and also as uh, this idea of material tolerance being part of all 3D printing processes, this idea that the stack actually needs to be consolidated and that we get a lot of imprecision along the way. In our project, we are building these sensor frameworks that bring together different ways of sensing. Uh, we have camera tracking, uh, 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 3D uh, scanning, uh, heat cameras, and uh, environmental humidity and temperature readings that all bring uh, come together into a time uh, set, uh, time series data, which can then be used as um, uh, data for the predictive model. So of course, when working with the machine learning, it's really important to consider where the, the data actually comes from. But when we work with sensor data, we enter a very information rich uh, practice. So what we're trying to do here is find the right case for uh, 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 AI uh, uh, for fabrication practice. Um, this is one of our very uh, early studies here, looking at how um, the combining of two different recipe levels uh, uh, mean that the material raises up, it gets it sort of swells in this particular way. Um, and where we're using uh, the input uh, of the sensor data to the sort of output of the 3D scan uh, as a way of uh, building a predictive model. Um, or here we can see the heat camera and the uh, 3D scan model being correlated into one data set where we can see the contraction of the material uh, over time as the water extracts out of the material. Yeah. So uh, when we're working within the framework of the design, our interest is to uh, to, con to consider how new models that harness the limited lifespans or duration and volatility of uh, biopolymer uh, is understood not as failures, but as active design parameters that we need to interface and characterize with, uh, uh, characterize and interface with fabrication restraints to be able to understand how to properly deploy them. Um, which leads me then to the uh, final uh, of these three uh, uh, discussion points, um, where, which is about the living, so the idea of a, uh, of a living material substrate uh, for an architecture. Um, oops, sorry. Yeah, so uh, in our work here, we're looking at bioluminescence uh, as a way of being able to enter the problem. So bioluminescence is not a good architectural light source. You have to be in absolute darkness to see it. And if you're a little bit light blind like me, then it's very hard to see sometimes. Um, so it is not in a sort of functional sense that we want to build a new light source for architecture, but rather we see it as a very um, intuitive and direct way of being able to instrumentalize how to work with living organisms. Uh, the work uh, with living organisms uh, and uh, bioluminescence has many different trajectories. There are examples uh, both from France uh, and also from MIT, uh, but also design studios. Teresa van Donken has been working with very interesting um, uh, examples of working with bioluminescence in algae. Um, so it is an understood field, and these organisms themselves are model organisms that are um, quite consolidated in their behaviors and also accessible. They're used for biomarking uh, in different uh, bioinformatics uh, uh, um, practices. Um, 
our work with it has been to try to understand how we can think about a sort of substrate, how to architecturally design and thereby steer the performance of living organisms across different kinds of substrates um, um, as a shared uh, surface or interface between or for interspecies uh, inhabitation. So how do we as humans live together with other species and how can we sympoetically uh, construct a shared environment? The collaboration was done with uh, Aurélie Mosset at INSAT, uh, which is the School of Design in Paris, um, uh, who runs a soft matters uh, group. So our first assumption was to really think about, well, how could we uh, think of uh, 3D printed uh, hydrogel, so the medium that the, the uh, uh, bacteria live in as a host for life. So could we build these micro architectures that would be able to uh, uh, light, uh, that would be able to um, steer the uh, living premise uh, for these uh, uh, bioluminescent uh, bacterial co colonies. Um, what we see here is that um, by exploring the different topologies of the 3D print, we can see that we can steer the different lifespans uh, of it. There's a lot of testing in understanding how the bacteria access both the medium, which is nutrition rich, um, which has the right salinity, which is not too acidic, um, and at the same time has good access to oxygen. So the, the complex topology of the surface aids the bacteria in having uh, the right, or as much access to oxygen uh, as possible. Um, what we're looking at here is how to track the metabolism and the growth and death of the bacterial colonies um, for them to be able to actually steer how the, uh, the process would work. We started with building some very early uh, simulations here, particle-based simulations of understanding how the bacterial colonies actually migrate through the material. There are big mistakes in some of these uh, simulations that we are uh, finding out ways of, of correcting our assumptions about how the bacteria actually works. Um, and, and how it migrates, and thereby understanding how design parameters in the physical can steer the temporal and behavioral uh, 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 aspects of the living organism. We also worked with students with this. Um, let's see. Hmm. Uh, at INSAT, um, that had wonderful interdisciplinary uh, uh, sort of outputs. These were textile students. They immediately thought about 3D scanning textiles, dipping textiles into medium, using textiles as substrates, dyeing the materials, uh, finding out how squid uh, ink would actually prolong the life and the luminescence of the bacteria. Um, um, which has led us to other ideas, such as being able to create these textile substrates that are use capillary action to suck up the medium uh, into the structure. So we can start using uh, digital embroidery as a way of steering um, uh, bacterial growth. So here, our sort of uh, assumption would be that to truly enable the integration of living systems into design, we need to build new models for design integration, for capturing, is, uh, characterizing and predicting living performances of organisms and their functionalized interaction with their environment. And we need to build the temporalized uh, representation to understand how they can impact propagation and lifespan. So to conclude, um, this is really the, the basis of the uh, eco metabolistic uh, framework that we are endeavoring into right now. We, it, it posits a hypothesis that a holistic conceptualization of architecture as an organism built out of living materials can empower the instrumentation of otherwise suppressed properties of bio-based materials, their embedded heterogeneity, 
their complex dynamic behaviors and their environmental responsiveness to offer a constitutional readdress of the drivers of sustainable material uh, building practices. Thank you very much. Great. <clears throat> very, a lot of information actually uh, matter. Mm, uh, I think uh, it's a great um, progress you have made uh, in the past two years because uh, it's a great honor uh, you invite me to participate in OCHAIN uh, 2018, I think. Uh, and I visit uh, your uh, school, uh, CITA. I think uh, it's, it's, uh, it's super uh, interesting what's happened in your school, uh, uh, very impressive. Although it's not uh, big enough as in imagination, but uh, it's, it's a lot uh, super uh, inspiring um, research you already uh, uh, produced, uh, introduced to us. I think uh, it should be a very big uh, uh, team doing such a very interesting research and uh, I think it's already impress impressive from uh, my, my, my point, my, my perspective, I think my impression uh, from your lecture. So it's, it's great. Um, I think uh, uh, firstly, maybe you uh, mentioned about UIA, you, uh, you want to organize the special, um, uh, uh, special event in 2023. That is special, very uh, meaningful because you put forward sustainability as a kind uh, is a very big challenge to the planet, all of us. And uh, you will try to figure out, uh, set up a special vision, which will influence the whole world and leading us in the next uh, ten or fifteen years how we should make action uh, to uh, to reflect on this special topic. I think. Uh, it's very interesting, and uh, we're looking forward. Uh, all the audience should uh, um, uh, give some feedback and uh, focus, and uh, uh, to 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 check what's happening on 2023 UIA uh, conference. That's it's very meaningful for the global uh, action. We should uh, really doing something feedback to the climate change and to sustainability. Uh, from uh, our discipline, from our own perspective, that's uh, that's a very meaningful fit, uh, foundation of uh, like, uh, 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 a very uh, in, uh, important uh, uh, fundamental background introduction from all your vision, and uh, which matters a lot to your research uh, in the past uh, in the in the in the next research uh, uh, in CETA. and CETA is a very interesting I think uh, uh, school uh, and. Uh, research team, and especially you mentioned uh, the bio design, uh, you try to find a, a, a special um, a systematic ways to set up your research from three main words. You mentioned the harvest, uh, the design, and the living, uh, which is extremely interesting to me. I think uh, um, uh, too many details, but uh, first, I, I, I quite interesting you use uh, um, um, the CT uh, uh, technology to um, examine or to scan uh, every pieces and all the, the log and the, the timber uh, and make a full use of them by their special performance, different part of it. I think it's extremely interesting because the industry uh, the timber industry is so important because of the sustainability, which is a very important material, and not only in Europe but also all of the world, including China. We try to figure out to set up different forests. For example, in the south part of China, they are planning the forest, and every fifteen years as a loop, uh, and every year they just cut down fifteen one fifteenth uh, of it and to make a full use of industry by a uh, very huge, very big uh, land to make it change the forest to be a, a part of industry. I think it's kind of um, uh, make full understanding of the carbon uh, issue uh, of this special material because uh, we can make a full use of the timber in the future. But it's especially very, very, uh, 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 Creative, uh, creative 
for your research is to make full use every pieces of log. Yes, I think uh, you mentioned it's a kind of harvest. Uh, uh, so um, I think uh, the first question goes to your research and the very uh, uh, artistic way to present uh, your uh, research and in your exhibition, you mentioned just open a few days ago. So um, I, I find it's interesting when you scan and uh, make maybe by the CT uh, uh, technology to scan it. So uh, uh, the laminate ways to make use of the timber is not that easy because the performance is so different compared to a different part of the wood and different uh, uh, species of the wood. So it's a so customized process. So how would you like to address this kind of uh, laminate technology after you scan it and how to laminate different performance into a very um, big industry? Because uh, when we make a building, it's not just like a pavilion of several pieces of this kind of uh, log. Uh, it's, will change to a bigger scale and probably it's um, hundreds of uh, cubic uh, materials and how to make it possible to implement this technolo technology into uh, su such a, a big difference of different categories uh, when you scan it. Is there any uh, customization process you want to change the, the timber industry, how to address such a big difference to make a full use of uh, so many categories uh, in a super big building, for example, it's not just pavilion scale. And mm. how would you like to address your technology into the industry? So that's mm. the first question I want to put mm. forward. As a, it's a challenging question, Philip. I, I think it's very fundamental, so I'm happy to, to engage mm. with it, but it's clear that what we are looking at is trying to understand how a more holistic understanding of the digital chain in timber uh, mm -hmm. or in the timber industry can be where information is shedded multiple ways along the, the process, how that information can, by bringing it forward into the design process, how could we know about building it? If we think about um, uh, uh, mass customization as a design, framework, then we know that we can build buildings with mass customized elements. We have seen that throughout the 2000s, 1990s, uh, that, that it's absolutely possible to build a building in which every element is the same, but every element is a little bit different, uh, in which uh, elements are tagged, uh, numbered, and called into the construction uh, and, and, you know, so we know where to put each, uh, every element. We also know it as, as, as slightly indulgent, I would say that as contemporary looking back sort of thing would, would maybe have a little bit positivist idea of thinking it was indulgent, but maybe we could think more positively about it and think, well, maybe they're precursors. There are ways of kind of finding out how to do something it leads us to mature practice that's now ready for other kinds of drivers than than the ones that were there before um, and uh, so we know that with mass customization that we can have practices in which every element is different we can call it we can steer that kind of building practice um, and so it means that what we're looking at here is really how design integration of the bespoke material um, could be then mapped to the, the specific design criteria that we have. So we make these bespoke elements that could then be numbered and placed into the building. Um, I think a very big difference between what we're doing in the research project and the real world is that when we are working with data sets, we work with the finite resource. We're given three trees by Microtech. We have that as a data space. This is the timber we work with. But that's not true in real timber industry. You, you don't need to work to the tree, you work to, to the timber yard and it is a much, much larger resource. But what we can see in Microtech is that they're actually using this idea of digital fingerprints. So they scan the tree and then mm -hmm. they tag it and they simply read where the knots are. They create a particular pattern. And this fingerprint is logged 
and brought forward. So they can always find that piece of tree again by its particular pattern of, of knots. Um, so even though the space of data is radically changed from the three trees to the timber yard, then this practice of tagging and, and tracing each piece of material and placing it strategically inside the actual piece of lumber, uh, the, not lumber, uh, into the glue lamp, I think is, is, is very possible. Um, with it also, so, so I, think, I think actually mass customization and these new practices of digital fingerprints allow us to transfer this pretty directly. The question is why? So there needs to be a fundamental reason for not just mass producing. Um, and that is uh, what you were saying, that it's about optimization of the resource. And this is not about saying, I want to change completely to another found wood project or something. I love those projects, but this is not that project. Instead, what we're doing is we're saying, well, the value of the, of the of timber is here. We say we use the very, you know, this, the, the highest uh, qualities in, in furniture, maybe, and then the middle ones in, in construction, and then the rest of it in pulp. But if we can expand the use of timber, then we can use it more intensively, make toilet paper out of milk or whatever it is that the new non-wovens are made of, find another way of making pulp, and then use more of the timber start so we can use, uh, we can strategize more resource into longer durable products that allow us to carbon store better. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's very scary what you're saying about the 15-year forest. It is exactly also what's happening in Sweden and what they are seeing as being, you know, they, they just can't catch up. They know that they need to rethink the forest uh, forestry completely because otherwise we're going to ruin our soil, uh, which, which simply, it's, it's not, it takes a thousand years or something for soil to develop. We can't just use it up in 15 years. No? Great. Mm. And one more question follow from the floor, I think uh, from Antonio, um, he mentioned, thanks for your sharing such amazing exploration. The glue lamp experiments suggest that competition methodology in a perspective of ecosystematic ways of thinking can easily shift from the generalized, uh, gener gener generalized uh, optimization to an optimized use of material of different performance, including those of poor quality, and making it a real tool for resourcing awareness in which other materials and the construction system do think that the same type of a, a mindset could be applied. Mm, yes, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm happy I found the chat box. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very long sentence, uh, but I, yes, I, uh, I completely agree. So what we're doing is we're saying, could we make a holistic framework for bio-based materials? That's the first sentence, no? So we say, okay, well, maybe there's something called the harvested, maybe there's something called designed, maybe there's something called the living. It doesn't really work, and we're fully aware of it. There are loads of harvested materials in our designed materials, and you know, where's mycelium? Where would that actually, is that harvested or is it I mean, the, what? So it, it's not a sort of like, here is a very precise framework that we can all adhere to. It's more, it's instrumental. It ha allows us to set up some barriers to look at different kinds of questions and to be able to in to bring them together into this eco-metabolistic model. Um, and so when we do that, we also pinpoint particular practices. So we pinpoint glue lamp but it could also be straw, it could be hemp, it could be seagrass. I'm very interested in these new, in Denmark, we are all, we are 500 islands, maybe you don't know, but we are, we are like Greece, <laughs> Greece of the North, uh, which means it's all sea and we have no forests. Um, and, but there is a big uh, effort into trying to figure out where we can find marine-based, bio-based materials. What are they? Seagrass and algae. How can we build with algae? Um, in also in an attempt to reach the CO2 uh, 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 threshold set by the UN, which was set by nation, not by territory or not by usage, but by simply who hosts, which country hosts the biomass. Which maybe makes sense for China, 
but Denmark is minuscule. <laughs> we are very small, and we don't have big uh, uh, ecological differentiation. No, so, so it's it's interesting. So, th I think there's a very very broad class of materials that would fit into that, um, and which would maybe also vary in respect to how it should be instrumentalized, um, which is also perhaps why th this is a framework we we pioneer with and uh, it will have to be corrected uh, during the time of the project. Great. And uh, I have another question to your second uh, topic, uh, the designed part. Uh, you put forward uh, special concrete and um, it's really special. Uh, you uh, actually invent a certain kind of uh, bio uh, material based uh, uh, material, uh, uh, special concrete and you want to print it in a very sustainable way. So I think it's quite interesting. Do you have any test on the such kind of uh, special material? Because uh, I want to, uh, uh, to know the details of this kind of uh, performance of the material. I, 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 wish that, I wish it was what you said. It, it is more banal than that. It's a student huh. project. Um, okay. And I, I think it, it's, it's a wonderful project. Um, yeah. We were invited, it was, it was a student competition here in uh, yeah. Denmark, uh, yeah. inviting students to look at how could you use concrete uh, 3D printing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. what they did, uh, this team, uh, it was Adrian and Lars and Rasmus, uh, yeah. they invented this sort of composite wall that mm -hmm. uses ordinary 3D printed concrete, no bio concrete, um, oh, no. but then uses mycelium so they oh. use it as a formwork i think this is only the little oh, 3D so you have something in between right oh, okay yeah. so they grow yeah. mycelium inside which oh, you oh, use okay. as, a, okay. as an insulator for for heat uh -huh. not for sound and an insulation but, right mm -hmm. yeah for insulating. so it is it is a i mean if it's also a plant pot. <laughs> it's a very smart, three-dimensional, yeah, clever yeah, plant pot. Really but it is also a plant pot. But it, it's very beautiful, and I'm very yeah. pleased with Adrian's uh, achievement. Yeah. Last year, I remember I invite another American team. Uh, their the name is AI um, uh, uh, Fabrication. They actually invent a special material, which is a semi. Um, uh, uh, concrete and semi um, uh, bio material. They mix uh, that into a special concrete. Oh. And the win the, the, the Mars uh, 3D printing competition in the States last oh. year, that is quite amazing because that's a very interesting material and the performance is really good because they're doing some low test on that. And uh, it's it's the performance is have a very very good performance uh, based on that special materiality. So, so uh, but I would also wondered also, when yeah. I mentioned this, Philip, I wanted to point out that it's not a it's not a orthodox religion. I uh -huh. think it is a it's a it's a idea space. But of course, uh -huh. all the thresholds into that idea space are very productive. Also, okay. I think it's super interesting to be, mm -hmm. move across these thresholds between something that is relatively mature, like concrete mm -hmm. 3D printing, and then yeah. more novel technologies. I mean, mycelium is also becoming more uh, mature, yeah. but it, it's, so these sort of intersections are also very, very interesting. So it could seem very like, now we will never look at a piece of steel again. Of course uh -huh. we will. But I think uh, the point is to start looking at them from, uh, or to, to place sustainability uh, uh -huh. Uh, within the center of our practice and look from that and also not just sustainability as in green <laughs> architecture, but to also ask more profound questions of the philosophy and histor uh, history of sustainability to bring it into as a, a sort of productive problem in our practice. Great, great. Very interesting uh, project. And the, the living uh, topic is a little bit going to the micro scale uh, to produce a certain kind of potential possibility uh, to create a, a new uh, vision on the sustainability based on the, uh, the, the new material performance and new material process you produce. Uh, in the, uh, under uh, uh, the different, uh, the new fabrication technology. So that part uh, is really uh, something new to us, uh, I think, uh, which based on a uh, biomimic uh, process and also the new material produced is really interesting. Uh, 
for the eco uh, metabolic uh, uh, ballistic uh, architecture mentioned. Mm -hmm. And so, do you have any further uh, plan after you invent uh, this kind of eco metabolic uh, material? Uh, what's the next step you want to? Would you like to transfer to a mega school uh, based on this kind of a uh, mm -hmm. micro uh, material I, process? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're putting your finger right on the soft spot where it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, excellent. Yeah. Um, but I think um, so. The bioluminescence is a placeholder. You know, we know it doesn't perform particularly, it's, it's not about function. Uh, it's more about a place to start building the methodologies for it. But I think you're completely right. It's also very, very important to figure out where will it then take us. Um, we have had students work with other biological systems such as um, hygromorphic uh, spores that uh, are able to contract and expand. They, you know, they, they like bacteria that are in a sleeping state. They sleep for millennia inside of the state and they, they uh, expand and contract with, um, with humidity um which is an interesting way of working with the material and although it is not dead then it is dormant so it's it's different from a living metabolism so i think um i don't i i i don't know if i see all the way through the tunnel um yet i i but i know it's an important tunnel to look through uh, and we are building the networks for that. So we're working with marine biologists, but we're also looking to uh, very exciting labs uh, at Newcastle University with Rachel Armstrong and also Martin Dade Robertson. Um, and uh, quite important work that's happening in different departments of biology here at KU, very interesting algae farming of polymers. Um, you know, where they say they can make these polymers that are as strong as concrete, but they cannot scale up. <laughs> so they can make a very, very great piece of polymer this big. So, but still, it is about teasing out what are the underlying methods that we could, so we can ready ourselves for a synthetic mm -hmm. biology, uh, or even not synthetic uh, uh, way of, of, of Think about new ways of producing architectures and new kinds of factories um, for us. Um, I think the eco-metabolistic eco model, I know it's a tongue twister, um, is, uh, is really, it's not a material, it's a, it's, a, it's a model, it's a theoretical model. It's also instrumentalized through particular ways of thinking. But I think what it calls into question is both the technologies of architecture, the design practices of architecture, but also the occupation of architecture. If we start living in an architecture that must always be maintained, then my role as inhabitant is also challenged. So this modernist subject that goes into the architecture and just is there is now maybe a participatory constructor of the architecture that she is part of, but that we always are part of constructing. So this is an idea of continual construction um, mm. and the mechanisms of that, whether it's automated or whether it's craft space. I, I don't I don't think that it it needs to be either or. I think this um, sustainable, you know, the the UIA project and the the idea of the many loci of where architecture takes place means that it can be low tech and high tech in the same, you know, it, it's interchangeable. It doesn't make it better that it's a robot. It could also be a hand. So, um. Good. Uh, one more question from, um, from me. Actually, UI have a quite big influence globally, especially in China. We have a lot, um, uh, I think, a, 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 a branch uh, uh, organization uh, follow uh, the UI's, uh, the, the uh, this 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 uh, association. So, uh, how uh, would you like to introduce the possibility for uh, the, the 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 expertise researchers in, in in the future? How to participate to the special events uh, you organize in the near future? How uh, the audience here could participate to this special event, and how shall we? 
uh, got information from uh, uh, the details, uh, 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 the schedules you want to set up, and how to uh, uh, to, to to attract more people participate to the, the, yes, the special. Yeah. That's a very kind question. Yeah, we are building the network now. Um, so we've established the scientific committee um, mm -hmm. and we will come out with, a, it's a sort of traditional model. Now there's a call for papers, please, mm -hmm. please do contribute. <laughs> we have a very, very broad understanding of contribution. We're very interested in design uh, scholarship. Mm -hmm. We are interested in academic scholarship. We're industry, interested in industry scholarship. So very, very broad in our outtaking. UIA, if I can say, uh, I should probably, <laughs> I won't say that sentence. Um, but um, I, so that's one way. But the other way is that we are with our scientific committee are building a series of pre-events in the next year. And mm. this will be on our website and we would love to um, have people participate in that. Um, mm. I think the one that's closest to our uh, community but not in an exclusive sense, but, but I think maybe a natural home for our community is Rethinking Resource, which is led by Carlo Ratti and myself. Um, mm -hmm. And here we will be building a, but we are interested in circular design. So we're thinking about all the different dimensions of considering um, a Rethinking Resource through circularity. Uh, mm -hmm. And we will be building a symposium here in December uh, 2021 and I would be very very pleased Philip if you would participate yeah. um, mm -hmm. I know you work with Carlo he talks very warmly of you mm -hmm. uh, and so it'd be, it'd be wonderful to have uh, to engage yeah. you and to be yeah. part of this but and Karate, <laughs> yes Karate, uh, we have a very uh, often connection to each other and actually when he was the, um, the uh, chief curator for Shenzhen Biennale we collaborate a lot uh, in the last event and also we will have further uh, a detailed discussion on how to engage into this special event at the same time i want to mention digital futures is a very important association platform we want to uh, engage more uh, to the ua uh, events and probably if possible I think uh, uh, our uh, community will contribute a little bit uh, to the whole events. Uh, so hopefully you can give us uh, more opportunity to, to participate in uh, 2023 UIA events uh, conference. <laughs> yes, yeah. I will find a, we, well, maybe we should have a special conversation about this, but it'd be wonderful. We have different panels. Maybe yeah. we should have a digital futures panel. Um, yes. So we have, for instance, a Nordic panel. We also have a student panel. We have different. Mm -hmm. So it'd be very, very interesting to find ways mm -hmm. of holding um, mm -hmm. all the work that you are doing and the communities that they engage into this uh, event. It'd be wonderful. That's great. That's great. Thanks a lot. So Neil, uh, do you have any question you want to put forward uh, to? Uh, yeah, well, I mean. <laughs> Thank you, Meta. That was uh, that was amazing. Um, really good to see. Um, I mean, just to say that Meta and I, some time back, uh, were colleagues at the University of Brighton, and since then, I've I've moved on to the states. It's actually for me, it's kind of interesting in some ways. Um, uh, I've now based in uh, outside of the, uh, of Europe, and. Uh, and 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 in some ways, I'm losing touch. But it also, it gives you a certain privilege privileged viewpoint where, where you can see things in perspective more in a way. And uh, what I think found it really astonishing about the um, the presentations um, over the last few days, uh, especially by the Europeans. I mean, I think this was really remarkable. That's Eretti and uh, um, uh, Philippe and, and Akim and yourself is the kind of common theme, the shift that's happened. Um, uh, towards the kind of not just the fetishization of technology itself, but towards the, but towards the kind of environmental concerns in which they are inscribed. And that, to some extent, um, we are uh, trying to follow ourselves in, in, in digital futures. We uh, have looked at looked at the question. Antonio had shared a session on um, on sea level rise, and, and we looked at the Amazon. We looked at uh, Bangladesh, and so on. These, these are important issues now. They come on the horizon, so it's a kind of like the environment. You cannot ignore the environmental. Um, uh, but in many ways, I think Europe is is taking the lead in many of these things. And I, I having sort of having spent uh, one semester in um, 
in, in Copenhagen, um, a delightful semester in Copenhagen at your school, uh, Meta. Um, I, I'm only too aware of the fact that I'm, even though um, uh, Denmark is, uh, is the, the, the Greece of the North, all these islands, is actually connected now with a, by a bridge with Sweden. And um, of course, uh, across the bridge in Sweden, that's where uh, we have Greta Thunberg. And um, I suppose, that, you know, from the position of the states as a kind of European who's based largely the states now and um, and looking at, um, uh, at, at Greta Thunberg, you cannot help but see the contrast between someone like Donald Trump and, and, and Greta Thunberg. Donald Trump, really old school, uh, is very uh, kind of exclusivist, you know, uh, concerned only about America uh, 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 and, and exiting the, the Paris Accord and so on. And, and then and then this kind of a very top down in his way of thinking, very undemocratic. M meanwhile, Greta Thunberg is about the youth, um, about you know coming together um, uh, and about the future in many ways. And I, there, there cannot be a bigger contrast than those two. And, and it strikes me that in some ways that that is that is the really the kind of the the, the way forward. I mean, we don't have a Greta Thunberg in, 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 in edu architecture education, but I mean, in many ways, what we're trying to do is to try and uh, to do that, to kind of shift beyond a world in which somehow um, uh, commercial concerns and exploitation and so on become the drive to, to a world where actually we're more concerned about the, the, the holistic whole of the, of the, the planet and, and about the living together as one. And I think that is that is a fundamental shift. And that's in a way what we're trying to do with, it, with this platform is to um, to recognize that we're all on this planet together. You know, we're all on this planet together in, and that we need to share resources, um, not least because uh, one other nation uh, has an impact on the rest. You know, if uh, if one nation is suffering from COVID and doesn't have enough vaccinations, that's going to impact upon the world, likewise, in, in terms of, uh, of carbon emissions and so on. So we cannot ignore that anymore. And I think, you know, there is a kind of paradigm shift happening in many fields, you know, away from that old fashioned authoritarian top down um, uh, concerned only about the self mentality towards a more uh, kind of environmentally friendly, uh, sociable vision of the future democratic one. And that's really, I mean, in a sense, what we're trying to do to try and make these ideas as accessible as possible, totally accessible to the world outside without any registration, mm -hmm. but you can just go straight in here and follow and watch these debates happening. That's that's a, a fundamental principle about what we're trying to do. So all I would say is it's really good to, from the distance of, I'm in Venice, but not your Venice, I'm in Venice, California, from the, from the distance of, of the States to say it, it's so gratifying to see this shift and, and a, a kind of shared discourse. It's not just simply the kind of inner chain model where you've been collaborating, it's actually the discourse itself is shared. I mean, there were these these terms about the circular economy that already started, and I, I heard them being repeated again and again, and it seems like, you know, that, that Europe but that has been a, has been the driver of, of many of these things uh, and um and, and it's it's great to see that not only it's happening as a whole but also within 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 the the, the architectural community and with the the, the group of, of computationally advanced architectural community so I would just say it's fabulous it was great to see this um, um I miss Europe I can't I can't get back there without being in quarantine for a while but um it, it would be great to get back there soon so just it's 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 fantastic meta congratulations um it's wonderful to see how how CETA has evolved it's wonderful to see how that kind of that collaboration is involved and it's wonderful to see how how you know you you guys in Europe are really taking the lead I think in terms of environmental concerns especially in architecture so thank you so much it was really a beautiful presentation and uh, very um, very inspiring thank you Neil thank you very much um, Antonio would you like to have any question to Meta Antonio is also in Denmark. <laughs> yes, yeah, really? I know that. Yes, <laughs> we, have, oh. we have two schools in Denmark. He is an, nice. from another school. <laughs> oh, okay. Are you in? Where Where are you, Antonio? I'm in Aarhus, actually. Ah, lovely. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you can see Aarhus in my background now. <laughs> well, I mean, I since you called me up. Um, um, you you just mentioned uh, answering uh, the question that I was posing about uh, other kind of resources, no? And you were mentioning about the the, for example, harvesting materials from the sea, and uh, uh, like all the the potential of like expanding the um, to weak materials, no? To or to materials that have never been considered for um, 
for the construction industry because they don't present the characteristics you know, that usually are uh, are those of construction materials. And I think this this idea of like understanding the the performance of other types of material and then repurposing them uh, or incorporating them in a much more expanded um, design process and design uh, construction industry is uh, is super super interesting and uh, I, I think also in somehow that influences a lot what uh, the type of architectures that that of course comes out of of these uh, weaker materials no and I think I, I, I find it really fascinating, you know, this, this idea of not uh, considering architecture to be so stable, so finite, so so rigid, you know. And uh, which, so uh, you 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 have shown a few uh, pictures in your presentation of uh, Danish vernacular architecture as well, of this. Uh, uh, barns with touched roof, uh, with with uh, materials that are kind of always in evolution, and that's something that I'm. I, I've, I've very recently moved to Denmark, but I'm becoming increasingly interested in this uh, this dimension, you no, know, of how uh, certain certain also traditional materialities are already involved this uh, this du duration, no. The, the seaweed house in Lazo, no, oh, is, a, yeah. is a very famous example here. Mm -hmm. But of this this idea that it, it's always alive, it's always like uh, it always needs to be retouched, but it always it's always uh, kind of, uh, evolving, you know, in a timeline. Mm -hmm. um, this is more like of a comment, but I guess uh, somehow uh, maybe maybe, like, maybe on the I, I wanted to ask you about this connection also with the with the traditional knowledge you no know, which... mm. yeah yeah so I, that's also what i picked up on because i i think i would be very sad if it was romantic i mean i think we are we have no aim to be backwards looking and saying that thatch roofs were better or i, I and i see a lot of that around me that the focus on sustainability, on the focus on uh, con reconsidering our material palettes um, has a sort of retrograde uh, uh, arrow built into it. I think that is wrong <laughs> in one word. Uh, Absolutely, I totally share with you that, yeah. that preoccupation because I mean, I, so, but and that's also why I want to bring this uh, link between the complex modeling network or group, group of projects to the to this uh, framework together because I think we could not think bio-based materials without this fundamental instrumentalization, which is what the digital is about. So I think without the instrument, if you sort of said we're not digital architects. We're just architects, and now I want to work with these materials. Then you're sort of pushed up in a corner, which can be very retro uh, based, or is somehow on the uh, what's it called on the um, on the ground of the industrial uh, existing industrial uh, paradigm and existing industrial apparatus that creates the uh, materials for us. I think the reason why digital architecture has a real role in reconsidering this is because it is us that can create the advanced digital models. It is us that knows how to interface with uh, machine learning to be able to track data rich uh, 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 design spaces. It is us that understands robotic fabrication. And it is us that also has this extended digital chain in which material fabrication it or material design itself becomes part of an architectural concern. Uh, which it doesn't in a standardized uh, architectural uh, education or, or, or framing or, or practice even. No? Um, so I do think we have a very particular cons uh, a role within this emergent topic. Um, uh, and I, so, which is wonderful, no? it feels like, oh, but we know we could maybe be the ones who could come with these methodologies and could rethink these methodologies uh, for uh, a, a new kind of context and there it is this high-tech low-tech um, sp spread or dimension 
So to, to remember, it doesn't get better by it being made in mass produced for, for skyscrapers. There are loads and loads of buildings that we have to build that are not mass produced for skyscrapers. Uh, when we think about the, where, the build, where the population uh, explosion is actually happening. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, maybe it's, uh, Antonio, it's a little bit obvious what I'm saying, but I, I think it, it, it wouldn't necessarily be, it is in this context of these people that we are joining here, but outside our own sort of the boundary of our field, there are very different movements going on that I would be critical to. I, I certainly don't think that it was better before or something like that. No, absolutely. And I, th I think your, your, this point of view and like, it's not obvious at all, especially for example, in the context of Scandinavia, there's a lot of uh, uh, also backward uh, approach to it, which I, I, I totally agree with you is not the way to go. Conservative, let's call it conservative. Because <laughs> <laughs> conservative. <laughs> Oh, Philip, you're muted. Yeah. Okay, uh, Gustavo, Gustavo, would you like to have any question put forward? Are you here? Well, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you, Meta. I'm a fan. I, I was actually speaking with a professor and we were both looking at your presentation and he said that is so clear and uh, we should definitely look at it more closely. So my question to you would be, how do you, um, with how thorough you're looking at the problem, how do you see your efforts to educate different regions? Is, is that something that you're, do you see as part of your research or do you see that it's the lack of some of the Western countries not understanding the core issues? Um, and just to preface this, I'm, I'm going off of what Neil is saying. I think there's a lot of um, individuals, I guess in America that I can speak of that are not aware of what's really happening. And when I saw your presentation, it was very clear that you are so informed. What is our role as educators and um, students? How should we uh, follow our research ethically and morally? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I tried to exemplify a little bit through the presentation about our studio here in the start. I didn't really want to say, look, in our wonderful studio, you learn all these wonderful things. <laughs> what I was really trying to say is for more, um, these are the questions we're asking ourselves. We can see fundamental change appearing often we say we're presented with statements like it has never been more complicated than now and I'm, I'm not so sure about that I think that um, in my context living in Hamburg in 1945 would have been pretty complex uh, or other situations there it's not that we are it's not that it is that we have not been in highly acute situations where dramatic change has been necessary. Um, but it still is this flexibility of mind that we need to engage with. Um, and that we, we know we need to, I'd want to say flex that muscle, but it's not, it's more profound than that. No, it's a, we need to be able to uh, have much more fluid uh, understandings of innovation and uh, uh, implementation than the, the 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 technical platforms that we're standing on right now. So although I, I fully respect and understand the, the very large uh, research networks um, focus on bringing knowledge over from research into industry, um, this is not, I don't think that's really CETA's role. We do not sit inside a big technological university that has the muscle to be able to push those things. I think our role is to move agilely to the front of the horizon and ask the questions that we can see uh, before right. us and then to uh, yeah, profess uh, or, or create uh, educational frameworks in which we can share 
these these uh, critical frameworks and allow people to build their own critical practices. I think that's the most important thing about architecture is that everyone is responsible for how they enact architecture uh, themselves. So I think when I look at over the, when I think about what students need to know, then I think we need, they need to be allowed to be skilled up. I, I think it's a, very, very important that students have access to technology and that they have access to learning. And with um, the world of YouTube, I was going to say, but it is clear that digital platforms and here under digital futures itself, uh, there are that that way of being sharing and disseminating knowledge is fundamentally changing, not just from I can find a grasshopper tutorial within four minutes that solves anything, or I can write a question into um, the the, uh, the hub and people will answer me at four o'clock in the morning and I can figure out my coding problem. But also I have access to much larger understandings of critical questioning and understanding of, of theory um, that I would have to pay a lot of money to go to a very sharp uh, university uh, to do. I think digital futures is, is a wonderful democratic tool in that way. And that's why we so pleased to be part and pleased to participate in, in this construction. Um, so yeah, so one thing is we need to dem democratize how education, how knowledge is shared. Um, but we also need to democratize the access to tools. We need to uh, democratize the access to software, uh, to soft and hard tools. Um, and we need to uh, uh, help inspire our students broadly to reconsider their understanding of what an architect actually does. So I think that's some, the main focus. But maybe when I was taught, somebody thought they knew what architects do. <laughs> I would never have that assumption. I don't know what my students will do in 20 years. And I promise you, no, no, no tutor of my 20 years ago would have understood what we are doing now. So I think that that uh, humility in a way, no, it's a sort of like understanding that we, we, that we are in an unpredictable field, that real innovation is needed, and that it's only by by skill sharing and knowledge sharing that, that this innovation can actually happen. Beyond that, I would say we need to be politically active. It's difficult and it's, I'm, I'm not a great political activist, but I know that it's important to be part of, of political uh, discourse and to be part of the, the way that there are different frames for it, no? um, where we can then also position uh, the need for these changes. And I, for me, the UIA project is a project like that, although it is only for architects and it's a bit myopic as a political tool. Our aim is to create a document, a, a, a policy statement to the UN that places architecture as a tool for means of achieving the SDGs in 2023, we would say we come out of the uh, UN, of, of the of the Congress, and we have a document that can be delivered to the UN, and that can, if anything, just change a little bit the perception of what our field actually does. Uh, uh, Ameta, just one more follow-up question, and thank you for that uh, lovely answer. Uh, I think that you're such a great example for. Uh, what we should look for in a, not only a professor, but a mentor and someone that can inspire us to move forward. But my question is as follows, how do you see the role of high design, like looking at these algorithms or the engineering component? How do you see that relating to the design portion? How you teach design experiences to your students? Do they have to be engineers? Do they have to have a dual mind in engineering? What type of student are you creating for the future? Well, I think they're just architects. It's just that architecture is 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 many things. Um, I was just last week external examiner on the Masters of Architecture and Engineering at UCL, and it's a wonderful dual or interdisciplinary program. And I think there are real reasons for wanting to move towards this. Um, I think this. It's again, it's, it's actually really, it's about uh, skilling up. 
allowing people other kinds of skills. Here they are learning mathematical modeling and analysis. They're getting, you know, they're doing MATLAB so they can actually uh, create their own environmental simulations. Um, I think it is, it is facilitating uh, access to tools. I don't know if we are not doing that. I mean, I think that, that students in our course can also do that. I can also see that um, ETH has a very interesting interdisciplinary master's. Uh, uh, of course, ICD and ITKE has a very, very interesting master's. So I think there are, are multiple ways of creating these learning environments um, that sits across, let's say, interdisciplinary foci. So they have different focuses Okay, that, that allow us to understand different intersections of where fields uh, actually uh, uh, merge. Um, but I think uh, as an as a architect, <laughs> I think that our field is, you know, we're at the heart of it. It is, it is, uh, it is through space that these, um, it is through the synthesis into spatial proposition that technology makes sense. Uh, I think that's why the design project is so important and why the, uh, the, the, the problem of things not adding up, you know, the bicycle shed and the structure and the roof, and they don't want to do the same thing. You must do what you can. You must do the best solution possible. I think that ethos is, is really fundamental to the field. And then I think maybe you asked about high design. <laughs> I don't know if you asked it, but I would not be, I'm certainly not against high design. I think design and form and beauty are extremely important parameters as we enter um, a, a world of, of uh, rethinking our material practices. Um, design and, and form is, is meaning. And it's important that we make meaningful uh, culturally uh, uh, important uh, uh, structures that we can live in. It's not only the argument of beauty is sustainable because we keep buildings longer. It's also that we live in them. We need to we need to take care of ourselves and make meaningful environments that are uh, uh, places for 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 engagement. You know? So I I would never go. I'm not a technologist in that way. That some somehow we can shed shift the importance of of um, of design itself yeah it's great uh, vision actually uh, it's very kind feedback uh, to gustavo i think uh, matter your contribution is the leadership or to the community not only the you know chain and last time appearance you really play a very important leading roles in european uh, um, uh, action. I think uh, that's extremely helpful uh, and great support to the PhD candidates in different schools in Europe and help them to uh, uh, put forward uh, their research topic. It really help them to establish uh, their career uh, at a very uh, young age, I think uh, uh, it, that's really helpful. I can see your contribution to the and the leadership in the uh, InnoChain program. At the same time, this time I after I uh, listened to your introduction on the UIA uh, conference, uh, you're even more go go to a, a higher position uh, and play a more important leadership not only in uh, the, uh, the the digital architecture but also goes to a very big vision, which leading us to the sustainability topic uh, that will really matters, uh, not only to the active discipline, but also to an even bigger uh, a vision to our uh, sustainable living condition for the whole planet. So that's really impressive. I think, uh, Matter, your, your roles uh, in our community and uh, we are looking forward that you can play more important roles in the future and uh, and uh, your leadership will be really uh, important uh, help us uh, to attract and influence more young generation so thanks a lot uh, for your la great lecture today and uh, and thanks for your generous to um, uh, to share your knowledge and your presentation to all the community 
So uh, I'm I'm looking forward uh, to have you uh, in the near future to uh, help us more and contribute more to digital futures. And uh, uh, great thanks uh, to to your uh, lecture today. So Neil, would you like to make some conclusion uh, uh, for today's event? Well, I mean, I think. Um... What's interesting to my mind is is it's a kind of this is a debate about performance based um, concerns and you know I think that back in I mentioned this before back in two thousand and three I think it was uh, we had a conference in Bath on performance based concerns digital tectonics um, where Akin was a, was attending as a student actually um, and that really was the concern at the time about you know the performance should be about you know uh, uh, efficient structures but at the same time actually you know I think the efficiency of structures also is an environmental concern as as Philippe uh, Bloch has, has shown so I think what I, I just found out I got out of this is, is that you know the, the question of performance can go right the way across to environmental performance and, and structural performance and so on. And it is a kind of, it's an ethical responsibility today. We, we you know, the world has limited resources um, and we need to address this. And it's just encouraging to, uh, to see this be, being addressed with such uh, conviction um, and uh, a commitment by, by our colleagues in Europe. And um, I'm, I'm overawed by, by the, the collective view that is coming out from Europe right now. I think it's a really, uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful one. It's a very deep rooted one. And it's a very um, kind of, um, let's say a, a kind of shared one, because I think the way in which um, the team operates together, and I think it is a team, frankly, I mean, they're different institutions, but um, uh, Europe is very condensed. I mean, I think this is something that people don't understand is that, is that you, you literally could get on a bridge and go across from Denmark to Sweden. You could, it's that close, right? And, and it means that there's a different sort of dynamic in play in the sense that, you know, for just an example, at the end of the, of the eight year exhibition, everyone goes to each other's exhibition that doesn't happen in the states because we're too do it too distant and i but i think that the, that concentration actually you know feeds into things and it really has allowed this kind of um collective approach to evolve it, that is that is that is that, that can't be stopped now i think this is a revolution that's happening it, it it's going to work its way through and um and, and it's important too i you know i just i was just thinking um but just to put it back in our, our context i think you know uh what we're trying to do which is a, a kind of we're incorporating some of these concerns but we're operating primarily in terms of a kind of a different strategic platform um to operate and i'm just wondering meta's comment about you know 20 years ago uh, whether you whether her professors um would have imagined the possibility of um uh, of uh, uh, this what she would be doing this under the, the the under the name of architecture i mean i was just well, my point would be you know a, a a year ago even we could not have imagined the possibility um or maybe we were about a year ago, just beginning to speculate about the possibility of coming together on a global platform uh, and sharing knowledge. And, and my point being that actually this is this is this is not just simply an educational issue; it is also an environmental issue. We we don't need to travel the whole time to go to these conferences and so on. And you know, and I think that that, that what I would say is is that this is in a sense a dream come true. This this these lecture series, all of them actually, the ones we put together, in the sense that you know, it, it you know, you always want to be taught by the best in the world. Um, and and normally it means you kind of you watch their TED talk. You don't actually engage on the same platform. And now we've made this thing happen, which I think is amazing. That that you know this comment and I was repeated for for Meta because you weren't here, but at the uh, yesterday. But you know the idea that there's a single person in a single classroom teaching to a single group of students is completely obsolete now. We 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 now have we recognise because of COVID and and all these other things that we can share this platform. We can share knowledge, and you know. I mean, there's no going back and there's no going back after what Greta Thunberg has been saying, nor indeed is there kind of going back. And I, you know, I hope we can build upon this as a way of sort of collaborating and supporting one another. And especially, you know, I want to say this, especially in places where they are less privileged than us. You know, we have some, stu have some students from Uganda and, and, and Kenya and God knows every, all over the place, Egypt and Bangladesh, uh, who, are being, who are enjoying the, the benefits of this. So I, I just think it's a, it's a wonderful thing to see a kind of revolution in education that goes alongside this revolution. Revolution in, in environmental awareness. So, um, um, so thank you, Meta. Thank you. It's really been inspirational. And I want to thank you on behalf of all those people that you've never seen who are listening and watching yeah. to this and who see the recording of this. You know, oh, I had a discussion yeah. with some students in in uh, in Africa, well, in Egypt, Egypt, Egypt Africa, and, and they were just saying thank you. For, and I, I, you just, I mean, I didn't realize what what impact it's having, but it, it is having an impact. And uh, um, uh, uh, anyway, it's having a huge Wonderful. impact. And you would yeah, love to know great. who else is here, but uh, they're yeah. all over the world. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a wonderful community to be part of, uh, Philip and Neil. And I think, I think it it has really grown by being digital. It was wonderful anyway before, but it was a bit exclusive. And now I feel that we can contribute in much more direct ways uh, and much more, uh, you know, on the on the in the way that we are, which is wonderful because it brings difference into the into the scope. So it's it's wonderful to be part of your community, and uh, I look forward to more. Let's say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, so much. Lovely. Thank, Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your great, great picture. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Ciao, ciao. Bye, bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye, bye. <laughs> <laughs> if I can figure out how to leave here. <laughs> okay. Um.